I am excited to introduce Tarrant Rollins from Twitch TV. If you're not familiar with Twitch TV, uh, you can reproduce the experience of yelling at your brother playing Mario Brothers and telling him where to jump on the internet whenever you want. It's wonderful. Tarrant's been working uh, for four years on infrastructure at Twitch, uh, and he's got loads of experience that he's willing to share with us. So let's give it up for Tarrant. Thank you. Uh, so I work for Twitch. Not everybody knows what it is. Many of you do, probably. Uh, we're a live streaming website. We allow somebody to go home and stream themselves play video games. And more than that, we have content creators. They, they love what they do. They love that their job is getting to interact with the community and play games. Uh, we will also do things like host multi-million dollar tournaments. Recently, the International, which is the major Dota 2 tournament of the year, took place in Seattle and had around a $10 million prize pool for the first place winners which is a team of five people. So here's some stats from our recent uh, keynote. Um, we have massive amounts of bandwidth streaming through our network. We are number fourth four in the US, and we're located in about 22-ish locations, and we have one of the larger console networks with like 20-ish data centers. Um, so many of you are familiar with this old bash.org quote, you just, sometimes things disappear in your data center and you're like, where is this? So this was a common problem we had at Twitch back when I joined as an intern four years ago. We would push code by running PDSH across our servers. And you would do this by saying, oh, I wanna push this to app one through 15, but we reprovisioned app th three because it had a bad hard drive. And now your PDSH is complaining. So one of the senior engineers was like, hey, can we find a better way of doing this? And being the lowly intern I was, I discovered that our Nagios config was located in these files that had the host name. And I wrote a small little script called live servers where you could say, I want all the app servers. And it would look at our Nagios configs, regex, pull out the host names, and then spit it out in a format for PDSH. Uh, and the old quote about regexes is, is, now you have two problems. And we had two problems. So when I came back as a not intern, uh, they asked us to build something newer and better. So we came up with this project called Atlas, uh, unaffiliated with the HashiCorp Atlas. It uses Zookeeper for state tracking. Uh, it had a client-side agent. The config was all locally managed and put into the Zookeeper. We had a central server for doing API requests and doing searches. Uh, the entire thing was written in Go. This should look pretty familiar. Um, and then console was announced. Uh, a coworker messaged me, he's like, hey, this new console thing is coming out, and this was version like 0.1. I started looking at this, I'm like, eh, it's all right. And I looked more and I'm like, wait, this is literally what I am building. Why am I building code? So we started testing console. Uh, we had all sorts of tests from how many requests per second could we push through? How big could we store blobs in? How many servers and nodes can we handle? Uh, what happens if your nodes just continually randomly fail. So we had fun tests like while true kill dash nine console, wait, start console. And we found some fun bugs. Um, we also had this fun 24 hour stress test where we just threw as many connections as we could. We found some fun bugs and the HashiCorp people were amazing. Uh, we would report the bug, Armand would help us find the right logs and the right information in order to get the bugs fixed. After a couple weeks of this, uh, we had a meeting and you know every corporation you have your fun meetings where you have to convince everybody we managed to get enough of the company to buy into the console idea and to not write our own code because Armand would fix bugs for us so why why should we fix bugs <laughs> uh, so we now had to deploy console in our infrastructure uh, and there's four major steps here which is getting console installed on all of your machines finding all of your machines, um, configure all of your data centers, configure your services, and get Mindshare. So first we started with installing console. We have all of our own build infrastructure, we have our own app servers, we don't follow industry standards in all of these places. So we worked on getting deb packages for console, we worked on getting puppet packages for console, and this was before there was a lot of Mindshare around console. 
So we had to do everything ourselves. There wasn't a puppet package we could import. Uh, and we have terrible open source practices, so I'm sorry, none of it's available. Um, we got everything configured on all of our machines, uh, but now we had data centers. As I said earlier, we have 22-ish points of presence with about 20 data centers across the world. Uh, it turns out it's not terribly hard, but you end up with weird problems where a data center doesn't necessarily want to talk to another, or maybe you have a legacy data center that's running really weird hardware. It happens to have three NICs instead of four NICs, like your normal data centers, or this one data center is really running this like old version of Lucid that no one really knows anything about, or maybe you don't even have keys to the racks in that particular data center. It, you know, fun times. So we managed to get console set up in all of our data centers. It was a long process. Um, we had to go slow and push out one by one, and make sure nothing broke. Uh, next up was configuring our services. We did not have the luxury of making every service nicely register itself. We have Twitch TV is about seven years old. Uh, we have code that is less maintained than it should be, and we have code that is more maintained than it should be. So instead, we went through a process of bootstrapping our infrastructure by using Puppet to register where things should be and how they should be. This is leading to problems now that we're reconsidering how we're handling it. But it, was, it allowed us to bootstrap getting console off the ground and making it useful. Uh, one of the most important things I can say is make it simple. We created Puppet um, definitions that allowed us to quickly define what a service was, what port, what checks, what tags it needed. And it's allowed us to quickly get things registered into console, uh, make things easy. Finally, there's the internal mind share. Uh, I'm preparing to transition roles, so I will no longer be the main console caretaker for our company. So now I have to hope that I've done this properly. Um, the people who are stepping up and taking over after me, many of them have become converts and enjoy the HashiCorp tools, some not as much. But we've built enough mindshare amongst the various dev teams that they have started to build out their own infrastructure on top of it. They have tried to make sure that they are using console in the right ways and that they are getting benefits out of it. We've talked about moving to etcd and that gets shot down or moving to Postgres or building our own thing. But once again, why should we maintain this code if we already have a solution? Uh, we've gotten Mindshare in enough of the company that I do not worry about console existing tomorrow or in a month or in a year. People at Twitch love console, for the most part. Uh, next up, uh, we had historically used HAProxy for everything. Uh, we have this massive HA proxy file called HA proxy backend, and every single server is basically registered into this HA proxy. So if you want to talk to the master database, you know that you can go talk to port or localhost 1500, and that will take you to the master database. Or if you want to talk to this service, it will be on localhost 1700. The problem here is once you start getting HA proxy onto every server, and they're all doing health checks, more and more of your bandwidth, or not bandwidth, but CPU processing power goes towards those health checks. Your Rails capacity slowly um, shrinks as each new box is brought up and each one is health checking each other. So we've started moving to a world where, one, we don't hard code our hosts. Instead, we use something like console template because console template will allow us to automatically add or remove the hosts without having HA proxy fail because it can't look up a DNS entry anymore. In addition, we've been able to start including only a subset of HA proxy that we need on an individual box via Puppet includes. Uh, another thing we've started using console for is application, configura application configuration. We, uh, one path that we're taking in some places is using console template to write the config file. Uh, we have in addition, applications that are aware of console, they want to know where their upstream host is that they send their log data to. And so they'll look into console template, or console, and they will find the host names. Um, this is fantastic, but it 
sadly requires specialized coding in every application, so we don't do a lot of it. Finally, we have a configuration library called Forerunner, which is highly experimental, which will take command line flags, environment variables, and console and vari variables, mush them together, and then feed it to the application. Uh, this has allowed a fair number of our applications to move forward to having dynamic configuration instead of having to you know, go fiddle with higher files and push it to all the boxes. The main thing we use console for now is deploys. At one point, we would hard code a massive list of servers into our deploy system. And then you know, somebody goes and restarts app three or deletes it, and then your deploys stop working because app three doesn't exist anymore, who figured? Um, this would also require a manual deploy step every time a box was brought up. Uh, it was a huge hassle on our engineering team. So we tried to move away from this, and console has become our source of truth for where every box is, what services there are, and it, it's fantastic for this. Uh, next up, we're, we're trying to now add the ability to disable console, or disable deploys to a specific box, and we've done this by creating a simple dummy service that has this wonderful check, which just, you know, is a file there? Is it not? And then our deploy system can quickly filter based upon this feedback. Uh, this is making our system seem very, very happy because um, they like to disable boxes. Uh, so we, we've hit a lot of bugs in console. Um, a lot of them are our fault, others aren't. Um, one of the most fun was, turns out upstart by default will set your open file limits to 1024. And so if you have more than, you know, a thousand servers in a um, data center, you will then start hitting issues where it can't open connections to servers and your health checks start failing. And when this happens, you'll get random leader elections and you'll get boxes that will fail and come back and it becomes very chaotic and hard to monitor and figure out what's going on. Uh, we randomly stumbled across this because there was some error about a subcheck that couldn't run, and it looked like it was a memory error. So we're like, well, maybe, maybe we have our memory limits set too low. Um, catted the file and quickly saw this 1024 number, and like, that's not right. Um, after rolling this out, our problems magically disappeared. Uh, we've had additional problems with raft logs um, getting in weird states from locking issues, or not locking issues, but uh, the number's not quite adding up because some mutex wasn't correctly f passing. Uh, and Armand has literally been amazing. We, we describe the problem, he helps us find which set of logs we need to send him, and we send them to him. And every time we need to upgrade console, we can roll it out to a couple nodes, we see how it handles. Most of the time there aren't issues, but if there are an issue, are issues, we're able to quickly track down what it is, get patches, roll it out, and push it to the rest of the fleet. Um, cool. So uh, we were acquired by Amazon a while ago, and so we wanted to move some of our infrastructure to the cloud. So this was a big move for us. We were fully bare metal up until this point. Um, we started using Packer. Uh, the previous talk about how to build your base AMIs and having them register, it's almost identical to what we use. Uh, we have our base AMI, we run Puppet on it to get LDAP and your other core infrastructure. And then we can then push that to our systems and have everything pull from it and deploy to it. Um, so Twitch has quite a few developers. We're at like 100-ish now, most of them working on the web team. The web team has historically had one staging environment. Uh, so the way this worked is everybody had this, we had this merge tool that would merge everybody's branches into one mega branch and deploy it to the staging environment. And so to test your code, you would add it to everybody else's and push it. And then you hoped that a bug was yours and not theirs. Um, doesn't work terribly well. So we started this project of building more staging environments. And so we started by getting a second staging environment hand rolled. Um, we documented what was going into this, what was all the complexities. Uh, and then we worked on getting unlimited environments. And so the way we did unlimited environments is by building a Terraform module. It's fairly simple. Um, I've copied an example of it. Um, you have flags you can pass to it, like public, 
which if you set to one, will create another ELB so that people outside of our company can access it. Um, this simple Terraform module has been amazing. Any developer can put this into a Terraform file, can run it, and then they have their own staging environment that they can do whatever they want to. So the way we've done this is um, we use Terraform to create all the machines, to create the ELBs, to create the security groups. Um, we use Puppet and some public templates to configure the boxes, uh, to install the code, everything else. Um, Puppet is able to load basic facts about the machine from Factor via Terraform. We have a small little Terraform clip that's like echo cluster equal foo to some file, and Puppet will automatically pick this up. And everything Puppet does is based upon this fact. And it's just, it's very simple because you can take our base AMI and you can feed in any cluster name, and that base AMI will just instantly work for it. Um, we, we inform the deploy system. The deploy system looks in console to see what environments exist. Should, and then we can populate our deploy screen to say, oh, I want to deploy to staging five, or I want to deploy to Terrence staging one. It simply, by having it read from console keys, Terraform can write the console keys to create those staging environments without needing to make any API calls or anything like that to external systems. Um, it will let us configure the routing system. Our HA proxy loads all of its hosts now from console. It knows that staging five app needs to talk to staging five load balancer, needs to talk to staging five lib server. I mean, you know, pick, a, pick as complicated of a setup as you want. We can wire them all together using console template and console. And ELB, with SSL are all automatically created by Terraform. This closely mirrors our production setup of having a full C uh, CDN with SSL certs. Instead of though creating you know, a level three setup, which you can't do over an API, or if you can do over an API, is just sending them an email that then has some tech go and do a bunch of crazy work on the back end. Not a great API. Uh, the ELB with SSL just instantly solves the problem. You can quickly spin up the correct SSL certs without having them be readable by your end users, uh, which makes our security people very happy. And finally, it will set up all of our DNS records. Terraform has been life-changing for us in our ability to configure AWS without having it be fiddling with a GUI. It allows us to record what we are doing and pass it on to the next person so that way they also know what we're doing and they can edit it and move forward. So our staging environments have been a huge success. We now have n number of staging environments where it equals number of developers. It uh, has built the foundation for how we're moving forward with our production environments and moving our production environments into um, AWS. You can build one module that will define both your staging and production by switching between the staging VPC and the production VPC. It allows us to create you know, four staging environments for this new microservice and create the production from the same template module. This is just the beginning of where we are and where we're going. It's been a long path to get what little progress we've made, but there's so much more to do of getting proper checking on services, getting services to register themselves. Console and the rest of the tools that HashiCorp are providing, they're a framework for building your infrastructure. They aren't going to solve your problems by themselves, but they give you a bunch of tools in your toolbox that you can use to solve the problems. Console has become the foundation of our deploy system. It's become the foundation of how we find where things are and you know, move forward. Um, wow. This is very short. So um, that, I guess, is my presentation. Obligatory, we're always hiring. Come visit us. Uh, we have problems to solve. Some of them are legacy. Some are, you know, fun. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good place, though, and um, you get a lot of say in how you solve the problems. Uh, so I am really early on finishing this, I guess, but uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, 
Um, we had multiple problems with uh, data centers crossing and combining. So for example, like LAX and SFO would decide they'd be the same thing. Um, we solved that mostly by moving each data center to a different unique IP or port. That way they wouldn't accidentally connect to another one because they were configured to listen to a different one. Um, we also had some trouble with, um, a while ago there wasn't a join WAN at start flag. Turns out there's some weird bugs where console will come up, try and talk on the WAN, but it's not yet configured uh, because that is configured afterwards. Um, so simple, small changes like that have been instrumental in fixing console stability. Also, someone I'm hoping in this room convinced Armand to change to bootstrap underscore expect. Whoever did that, thank you very much. It was like a miracle. Uh, a few of our developers didn't like some things about console maintenance and the inability to introspect it from Puppet, or I'm not quite sure of the full logic there. Um, console maintenance would work fine. Uh, you're doing the same thing where in your deploy system you're just checking if a service is passing, failing. Um, we mostly wanted to save that though because we wanted to use console maintenance more for disabling routing to a box than disabling deploys to a box and treating those as two separate types of disables, I guess is probably the correct answer. Sure, uh, AWS ELB, so this isn't really HashiCorp related, but I'm happy to answer it. Um, AWS has awesome APIs for uploading your SSL certs into AWS, and then any you can grant permissions to your users such that they can attach them to an ELB and without having access to the actual cert itself. And because users can't log into the ELBs, you can't pull it out. Yep, same thing, and it, it's great. It simplifies Puppet and all the rest of your config management because it turns out securely distributing secrets to boxes is really hard. Though I hear Vault will solve that problem. We've sadly just not gotten to it yet. Have you had any issues with console templates at scale? Uh, yes. Um, the biggest issues we've had resolve around, revolve around how to handle data center failures. Uh, we have a very complicated setup in our data center topography. And so uh, in the place where that matters, people have written their own console template-like system called a RTM or something. Uh, and it will cache everything locally. And if a data center fails, it will use the cache version. Um, beyond that, our only console, we've had console template issues with Nginx not handling multiple restarts in a short period of time. And there's a patch now in console template that adds coalescing so that it will limit how often you restart and I think the maximum time between restarts. Uh, so that solved the Nginx issue. And are you guys using console UI or any of the console UI in front of We have the console UI up and it's served via an Nginx someplace and people commonly use that to go and look at things. Um, it's rather insecure because we don't have ACLs currently set up. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Tarrant.